Welcome to the biology review video lecture about ecology. In this topic, we're going to be doing a quick drill of what ecology is and what it's all about. And ecology is the study of the interactions that exist between ecosystems and the organisms living in these ecosystems. So between the living and non-living aspects of the environment, which we call biotic or abiotic factors. Ecology started a long time ago with the science of naturalism, which is the study of the natural world. Scientists still do it today as we go out and study the, or observe things in the natural world. But it's evolved into something much more complex. It's an actual empirical science that does research to try to understand the way that the environments in the ecosystem work. Basically, biology at its most complex level, at the highest levels of organization, which are the biosphere, which includes all of the life on Earth, which is split into different areas or different kinds of ecosystems like rainforests, deserts, and taiga, and other things like that, which we call biomes. Now, within each biome, you have different smaller systems, which we call ecosystem, like the rainforest has the canopy, the understory, the rivers, and other aspects of that environment. That ecosystem includes the living and the non-living parts of that environment. Now, if you only consider the living parts and all the different kinds of populations that exist in the ecosystem, you're talking about the community aspect of ecology. Below that, you have the population, which is all the numbers of the members of the same species live in a designated area. Of course, we're talking about population is built of individuals of the same species. And now we're starting to get to that, those other levels of organization, which we'll talk about at the beginning of the year. Two main aspects are going to be studied by ecologists when they do this. When you look at the ecosystem, like I said, it's going to be based on biotic versus abiotic factors. And here, in this picture, you can see both. You can see, for example, living factors like keystone species, which are crucial species whose existence modifies the ecosystem so substantially that their presence is actually critical for the ecosystem to be the way that it is. Like elephants that knock down trees, making the savanna looks the way that it actually does. Or there's the otters and the urchins in the, that eat the kelp and change completely some aquatic ecosystems in the oceans. We also have dominant species, which are the most common species or the species that pretty much overtakes the entire ecosystem. Like, for example, a lot of invasive species, since they don't have any natural predators, uh, those are the species which are introduced to an ecosystem they don't belong to, also called non-native species, they tend to be dominant. Another great example is even beings were also very dominant. The lions, the mangrove trees in the mangrove swamps, all of these examples of dominant species that dominate over the ecosystem. You also have the famous ecosystem engineers, which are species which actually change the actual abiotic structure of the ecosystem because they're constantly moving around factors, such as, for example, when the beaver cuts down trees to make a little pool and it actually changes the structure of the ecosystem or the junkers in, a, in, a, in some a grass, is it grassy lake environments or river environments or, or ants or coral or tall trees which block the sunlight and change the, the environment that was there before or even the burrow crab. All of these examples are what we call ecosystem engineers. Finally, when you look at biotic factors, you also look at all the interactions that exist within a food web, which is the interactions of feeding between all the organisms that exist in the ecosystem. There's also the abiotic factors, or the non-living part. The most important ones include sunlight, the climate or the weather, the water, both in the surface and the amount that precipitate, the oxygen levels and other gas levels like carbon dioxide, the salinity, the amount of nutrients or minerals in the ecosystem, the quality and shape and texture and all kinds of different things about the soil of the ecosystem and the occurrence of natural disasters on the ecosystem. All of these things are things which we consider abiotic factors. Now, when you're talking about ecosystems, you're going to talk about the way that matter and energy move throughout the ecosystem. But as we talk about that, it's important to remind you of the conservation of energy and of the entropy laws of thermodynamics. The idea is that matter and energy must be conserved in all circumstances. That their ecosystem's amount of matter, total matter, is always going to stay the same unless matter comes or goes to a different system, which then happens sometimes. Wind can pick up matter and take it somewhere else. Animals can migrate somewhere else. Things can happen. But matter must be conserved. It must have come from somewhere. It must have ended up somewhere. And energy is the same. Energy cannot be created or destroyed. It must enter the ecosystem and ends up leaving to somewhere. But also important that every time that energy is transferred, whether in the form of matter or whatever you're doing, some of the energy becomes more disorganized with time. And that's a very important concept of ecology because it's a reason why food webs are going to be limited. And we'll talk about that in a second.
energies of the earth comes from two major sources the minor source is going to be the earth's core which is still hot for a lot of reasons including radioactivity gravitational compression uh, leftover heat from the formation of the earth and other processes which are geologic and these things are important because they'll cause plate tectonics earthquakes mountains and all of kinds of stuff which will change the faces of the ecosystems but the majority of the energy of the sun and almost every single ecosystem on earth ultimately comes from sunlight Sunlight is the source of all the energy of Earth. And a very minority of the sunlight actually ends up being absorbed by the land, especially by life forms. In fact, if you consider the fact that plants only absorb the visible light spectrum, and not even all of that, that means that only 1% of the energy of the sunlight that actually hits the plant actually being absorbed into the ecosystems. But by then, most of the energy was already reflected by the atmosphere, by the water, by the land, and a lot of other things. So... These organisms which will do this capturing of this energy available either from the core of the earth or from the sun through processes which we call production are called producers or autotrophs because they can make their own food. That's what trough means. Other organisms that most consume food are called consumers. Now the most common types of processes to make production is photosynthetic food chains or chemosynthetic food chains. The photosynthetic process is when producers use the energy of the sun to trap energy into matter, organic compounds which are complex. So it increases in complexity of life at the expense of the energy of the sun and in that way entropy is ob observed and it's actually allowed. You're not breaking the law of entropy. You're increasing order, but at the expense of the disorder of the universe. And that's coming from the energy of the sun. And the majority of the ecosystems on Earth will be based on that. Though some ecosystems at the bottom of oceans, near hydrothermal vents, which are based on compounds coming off the volcanoes, and have bacteria which work on that, are going to be called chemotrophs. And they do not need the sunlight. And they actually would live even if there wasn't sunlight on Earth, most likely. But in most ecosystems, there's going to be a cycle between photosynthesis and cell respiration in ecosystems, where photosynthesis will produce the energy, in the, or at least store the energy from the sun into these organic compounds, which are called carbohydrates, for example. And then cell respiration does the opposite and ends up burning that same energy that was storing the glucose and releasing it for the animals to use later on. By the way, remember that plants will also do this because only the leaves, especially, actually, and actually only a small part of the leaf can actually do photosynthesis. The rest of it must breathe just like you and I do in order to maintain its life form and the rest of the plant must rely on the sugar that those few cells actually uh, produce. But cell respiration and photosynthesis are kind of like the opposite of each other. You see their formulas on the screen. And when a cell respiration releases the energy that photosynthesis stores, and the balance between the two of them is what maintains the powers of ecosystems. Now, there are three main kinds of photosynthetic organisms that you need to know about. The most ancient kind is called the cyanobacteria. It evolved first, and all other kinds of autotrophs are related to this original cyanobacteria, some of which are still around today. Now, these are bacteria which are capable of doing photosynthesis. Now, some of these bacteria, the theory is, became endosymbionts inside the cells of eukaryotic cells. And these, they're, they're basically similar to these organelles called chloroplasts, which is inside of every single plant cell. So there are three kinds of life forms which actually do this. You've got a cyanobacteria, which is a bacteria. You have algae, which is a protist. And you are, have plants, which is a part of the plant kingdom. So three different types of life completely are going to be doing this process in nature, photosynthesis. And remember, of course, there's also chemotrophs, which do it based on chemical compounds. Now, in order for these producers to do these things, they will need to have resources from the environment. And these resources or nutrients, things that they need, include things like the sunlight, which is not really a nutrient because it's not really matter, but it's definitely required. In addition to that, carbon dioxide, oxygen gas, water, chemical compounds called macronutrients, which are very important for life, like nitrogen and phosphorus. And then other smaller compounds, which are also important, like uh, the ones which are highlighted on the left side of your table. All of these things will be necessary. And if they're going to be limited, it's going to limit the amount of productivity that an ecosystem can actually sustain. Now, some of that productivity is actually going to be limited because the plant doesn't necessarily capture all the sunlight from the sun.
In fact, only 1% of the sunlight is actually captured because the majority of the sunlight is not in the visible spectrum and plants only capture the visible spectrum, but not even all the visible spectrum. The majority of the green light passes through the plant completely unabsorbed and the plants actually transmit and reflect the green light. Some of the energy of the sunlight, the visible color even, is not fully absorbed. Now this means that the plants are not 100% efficient at converting the energy from the sunlight to actual final glucose energy. And we also, throughout the process of actually capturing the energy from the sun to put it to glucose, a lot of chemical reactions take place where energy is being transferred from one form to another or from one molecule to the next. And as we learn in entropy, every time an energy transfer takes place, some of the energy gets wasted as heat as part of the process. It's called entropy. That means that throughout this process, the efficiency of the productivity is actually going to be lowered. And life tried to do this with the minimal amount of specs as possible, but still, of the light that was originally absorbed, about only 25% of the energy ends up in the sugar. And that's only, remember, you started with 1% of the total energy, but then only 25, less than 25% of that actually ends up in the sugar. And then not even all of that energy ends up in whoever eats the plant. Because the plant throughout its life will actually use some of the energy that it produces. The energy that it actually produces is called the gross primary productivity. And that depends on how efficient the plant is at converting the sunlight to the sugar. And that's called photosynthetic efficiency. But that gross primary productivity is just the amount that the plant produces. But it will use some of that to breathe, to grow, to develop, to maintain this internal and stable environment, to reproduce, to do all the characteristics of life. So the ultimate consequence of this is that these plants will use some of the energy, meaning less energy is going to be available to the person that actually ends up eating the plant. Now, how productive a plant actually is depends on how much it can increase its biomass. The total amount of biomass or the dry mass removing the water that the plant has increases if its productivity is actually higher. The bigger mass or the more amount of mass the plant has, which is called, by the way, a standing crop, the total amount of mass of the producers in an ecosystem, if that's increasing, that's what's usually the determinant of how much productivity an ecosystem actually have. So it's not so much about how much producers are out there, but how much more producers are happening and coming with all with time. That is what we mean by productivity, and the higher that number is, the better news it is for the ecosystem. Although if it's too high, it could cause problems for the ecosystem, and we'll talk about that later. All right, and then that takes us to the idea of consumption. Consumption is going to happen by organisms which are incapable of making sugar on their own, which are called herbotrophs or consumers. There's five main kinds of these organisms. You have Herbivores, which only eat producers, and that includes anything from a zooplankton, which is microscopic and only eats algae in the ocean, to large oceanic or aquatic mammals, to herbivores in the land. Then you have carnivores. Carnivores only eat other consumers. They never eat producers, and that's why they make some up there. And this could be as small as a zooplankton again, or it could be as big as a lion or, or, a, or a large shark. And then you have omnivores, which eat both from producers and from other consumers, so they eat at several different levels of the food chain. Now, remember when we talk about the plants, about the fact that when they actually produce the sugar, they end up using much of the sugar. And remember, we also said that they don't necessarily trap all the energy from the sun. The same thing is true about animals. When animals eat something, not all of the energy that's in the food they ate ends up actually assimilated by the body. And that is a concept that actually is called feed conversion ratio. Only a small amount of the food is actually converted into energy. The rest leaves as heat, as process of the excretion, and through the feces, which are not fully digested. Then, from what the stuff that's actually assimilated, much of it is actually going to be used by the animal to perform activities. And that means that the animal also has a production efficiency the same way the, 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 that the plants had. How much biomass that animal is adding to itself is referred to the animal's secondary productivity. And that means that's a limited amount to how much energy the next animal in the food chain is going to be able to get because much of the energy that this animal did is going to be wasted by its own life processes. Not really wasted, but used up by its own life processes or never even be absorbed. Okay? Now, we're going to stop the video here, and on the next video, we're going to continue this brief review where we're going to try to consult the topic, and we're going to do that by talking about the ecological diagrams and energy efficiency in the food webs. I'll see you on that video.